Good day, guys. We're here with Ed, the brewmaster here at the Black Creek Pioneer Village Historic Brewery. Uh, so, our beer geek questions for you. First, how did you get into the industry? Um, actually, it was kind of by accident. I was a self-taught amateur brewer for about 15 years, and uh, I got laid off from my other job. And right at the same time as the brewery opened up here, so I just kind of made that transition, and I haven't looked back. All right. And what is your favorite style of beer? Uh, I don't know if I have a real favorite style. I'm more of a seasonal beer drinker. So in the summertime, uh, I'm a hop head, so nice, good, bitter IPA or a nice, bitter lager. In the wintertime, really good Russian Imperial Stout on a nice cold uh, night sitting in front of the fireplace. Does it for me. Uh, if you had a least favorite style, what would it be? Uh, some of those crazy Belgians there. I just, I can't get around some of those styles there. You have three beers to drink, one from here that you would brew, one from another craft brewery, and one from a big guy. What would they be? Jeez, uh, well, my favorite beer here is definitely the IPA. Ah, uh, jeez, if I had to bring, uh, drink something from a local brewery, uh, it's probably would be the uh, Mill Street Tank House. It's, uh, again, it's a nice, bitter, bitter beer. And from the big guys, ah, uh, jeez. That, I don't know, I haven't had anything from uh, Main Street Brewery in a couple of years, so whatever is available, I guess. <laughs> well, they pretty much all taste the same. Yeah. Um, we already know that you're a hophead, not a malt maniac. It makes me sad. Um, <laughs> if you weren't doing this, what do you think you'd be doing? Well, I came, uh, I was a butcher for 20 years, so that's how uh, my, I first started uh, in, uh, working and then made the transition, like I said, into the brewing uh, industry four years ago. So I still still have a bit of a passion to uh, cut meat. So, uh, what makes this different than a modern day brewery? Uh, well, everything that I brew here is brewed using the same techniques and equipment from 1860s Ontario. Uh, it's all handcrafted in small batches. Uh, the barrels hold 100 liters, so I only keep them between 70 and 80 percent full. Uh, no electricity is used in this process whatsoever either. And the beers are all natural, no chemicals, no preservatives are used in the process either. Nor are they filtered or pasteurized, so you get a very rich, flavorful, full-bodied beer that's unlike anything you could buy in the LCB or the beer store. So I'm noticing a lot of copper and a lot of wood, not your usual stainless. Right. So everything again, just like it would be back then equipment-wise? Cop copper was the preferred choice of metal amongst brewers because it is such a good conductor of heat. As a matter of fact, to this day, you still see a lot of brew houses that use copper kettles for that reason. Alrighty, um, filtering, how would you, do, do you do any filtering at all? Uh, well, when the wort goes up into the cooling ship, which I'll show you later on there, you don't want anything floating in there, i.e. your hops, right? Because it's gonna clog all your valves and your spigots. Once the wort is in the cooling ship, everything at that point is all gravity fed. So we do strain it out through some cheesecloth that uh, that would be I, I don't consider that filtration but some people do alrighty so um, do you want to take us through a little walkthrough of what you have over here yeah so it's a very simple two vessel brewing system to my right over here we have our kettle just to the left of that is a mash tun again they're both made of copper copper was a preferred choice of metal because it is such a good conductor of heat because it is such a good conductor of heat it also radiates heat out Hence the oak skirt on the mash time. That's basically 19th century insulation. You want to keep everything toasty warm when you're mashing. Behind me, on the very top, we have our cooling ship. Cooling ship is nothing more than a big copper bath. If you take a look at it from underneath. And the whole principle behind a cooling ship is you're taking a boiling hot liquid, you spread it really thin, you increase the surface area, let it cool naturally, because they did not have refrigeration in this time period. On the very top is our hot back, which while I will be lining with cheesecloth, the barrels on the top are used to ferment the beer in, and on the bottom we use uh, the barrels to condition the beer. And we were talking before about brewing in the summer, so right now you're not conditioning in the bottom? We're not conditioning. That's the other big historical inaccuracy that we do. I mean, ales love to ferment at room temperature, but you should be conditioning them as cold as possible. So shelf life on them is very limited for that reason. Well, it, it looks amazing, and I'm super excited to see you do some stuff in here. I'm sure everybody else is. Yeah. So, so today's you. brew will be an India Pale Ale. Oh, an and, IPA. Uh, yeah. 
and we'll be mashing in very shortly. All right. How do you transfer your water from one vessel to the other? Well, that's a good question. Uh, everything is all done by hand here without the use of electricity. So you see my little pitcher over there? Uh, that's what well, I figured it was yeah. for. <laughs> so very time consuming. Uh, it can be. It's not too bad. I mean, uh, I do 100 liters. Uh, yep. Some of the big larger breweries back then, if you're doing like a thousand liters, uh, everything would have been gravity fed back then there. They would have started at the top of the brew house and it worked their way down. So you're using gravity as your friend, much like I do over here with our cooling ship. You'll see that in action there. There's a little wooden trough over here. Once the wort does cool down to a fermentable temperature, I'll open up the valve. Wort runs down the wooden trough into the funnel. I always get nervous too because it is a, an open vessel, so I'm, I'm always worried about you know something going in there and contaminating the beers. But I've been lucky so far. Uh, beer barrels. They don't make beer barrels anymore. To get beer barrels made, they have to be custom made by somebody, right? Which would probably you know increase the price ten times over. So the main difference between a beer barrel and a whiskey barrel is the staves on them on a, whis a beer barrel a little bit thicker. That's the whole pressure, right? They would condition the beers in the barrels. I try conditioning the beers in these barrels and they just don't hold the pressure right. So the carbonization is anywhere from very, very light to almost non-existent, right? Which is still within style for that period, right? Don't expect a highly carbonated beer. And with the yeast, do you reuse? Uh, I don't reuse. And that's only because I have enough trouble uh, keeping the barrels sanitized, right? So uh, again, I'm having the same problems they would have had back then. Uh, I've tried everything, you know, all these nasty chemicals, but what happens because wood is so porous, chemicals leach into the wood there and you could rinse it all day long and you think, okay, you got it all out. As soon as you put your beer in there, it slowly leaches back into the beer and it, you know, it'll affect the flavor. So now it's just strictly boiling water that I use. But once you get an infection in the barrel, it's pretty Barrel's much done. game over there, yeah. So uh, next year, this is our fourth year. Uh, we're going to uh, replace all the barrels. Last year I took him to a cooper and he opened them up and cleaned them up a little bit. He said uh, condition-wise they were still in pretty good shape. It's just a Again, it's a gas stove. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no chimney here, so they can't just start you know, gutting up the historic fuel and put a chimney in there. So, which suits me fine because uh, <laughs> you don't have you know, to stoke I, I wouldn't want to be coming in at 6 in the morning stoking the fire getting the, the hot water ready. So. Uh, I can live with that, right? So our first first step in making uh, our beer is uh, taking our barley, placing it in the mash tun with a predetermined amount of hot water. What you're doing is you're heating up the barley to between 140 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit, where it'll activate the enzymes that were formed in the malting process. Those enzymes will then convert the starch, which is naturally present, into a fermentable sugar. I'll let that sit for about an hour, and then I'll infuse the mash tun uh, this is all English ales that we do here, so it's all single infusion, right? I'll infuse the mash tun, let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then I'll transfer the liquid back into the kettle where I'll bring it up to a good, vigorous rolling boil. We start adding our hops at that stage. So I'm just going to uh, wait another minute there. I love all the brick, copper, and wood. Really good. I think we're close to our strike temperature. And that is the best thing I've even, ever seen. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times I don't even use a uh, thermometer. When I first started working here, I always wondered how brewers back then would get their strike temperature on, right? But uh, believe it or not, when you're brewing on a consistent basis there, you can see the steam coming off the kettle and you could get uh, pretty close there. I'm lo probably looking at about 76 Celsius right now, so. And that's the strike temperature that I'm looking for. So I'm just going to verify it with my thermometer. Ready? Yeah, I'm betting the, the longer you do it, the more you can just see it. And even if you're off by a couple degrees here, it's no big deal there. The one thing about these beers is there's no consistency, right? If you were to come in one week and you just absolutely love your particular style, probably the next one will have some subtle differences to it, right? So again, I do that on purpose. I'm not trying to be like a Molson or the bats, make consistent beer week in and week out. Well, on the, on the scale you're on as well, it would be hard to do, would it not? Uh, yeah. 
So it's a little bit low, so we're going to let that sit for a couple minutes. Usually I got a routine too. I come in and I clean the barrel and I fill the kettle. And I know when I'm done there, the temperature is pretty close, right? So. So I'm going to put 45 liters of water in our mash tun. And we'll add our barley to it. She's got a little dipstick with that way of measuring. I've got a for the kettle and then for the mash tun there. So it's one thing that I do make sure that I consistent on is the uh, volume of water that I'm mashing in. that we use here is all modern, unfortunate. But what makes these beers historic is the fact that we use the same brewing techniques and equipment for this time period, right? I do try and attempt to do a true historic beer once a year with barley and hops that are growing right here on the property. I'm not sure if I'll be able to do one this year. The barley just took a big, big beating there. Remember July, there was no rain and it was extremely hot out, so it stunned the barley. Not sure if we're going to be able to salvage it this year or not, but if we can, we'll definitely attempt. So that's to your, that. your one mile. Yeah. That would be the uh, yeah. Oh, I love that smell. That's what I was saying. Just want to make sure you stir that up really good. You don't want any dry spots in here. Uh, 
water that I infuse the mash tun up to about 80 plus degrees Celsius. Oh, that smells bad. So I'll fill the mash tun to 120 liters, give it a bit of a stir, and then let it sit for a couple minutes. Then we'll start separating the liquid, which is now called a sweet wort, and transfer it back into the kettle. Quite a few faults in uh, 19th century brew houses by our standards. The biggest is uh, on or aeration, but uh, there's no way of getting around it. But uh, if somebody had a, a beer that was uh, oxidized back then, I doubt he would, you know, tell the bartender, "I'm sorry, but your beer is oxidized." There, they probably wouldn't even know what that means, right? So, so we do get some uh, hot or aeration uh, happening here, and again, there's nothing you can do about that. So we're going to open up this valve. We're going to start separating the liquid, which is now called a sweet wort. I just try to get it to hit the side of the bucket there. And the first little bit is really cloudy. I don't know if you can tell. If you want to bring your camera over there. It's pretty cloudy, right? So we're going to recirculate the first 10%, pour it back into the mash down until it starts running clear and then we'll transfer it into the kettle. The other thing you gotta make sure is you don't let your kettle run completely dry. Because if you do there and you put your wort in there, you can scorch it. Once you've scorched your wort there, it's just forget about it there. You're never gonna get that taste out of your beer. So I always leave a half inch of water right at the bottom there. You don't want to run it too fast because then your efficiency drops. It's not the most efficient system to begin with. It's only about 75% efficient. Modern brew houses like your Molson's and Bass nowadays they run into like 98, 99%, so there's very, very little sugar left. But brewers in the 19th century, they were very frugal, right? So they wouldn't throw anything out like we do nowadays. They'd reuse the spent grains over and over again. One of the very first things that they would do is they'd refill the mash tun up a second time and try to extract the rest of the sugars out of there and you'd end up with a very weak watered down beer that was typically one to one and a half percent alcohol. That was called your smaller table beer. That was put on the dinner table for women and children to drink as well too. Because remember, it was a lot safer to drink beer than it was water because it's been boiled for over an hour. Once it's turned into, once you've taken your water, turned it into beer, there's no virus in there that can survive because of the pH and the alcohol that can make you sick, right? Yep. The only thing that'll happen is you'll pick up the bacteria, it'll slowly turn the alcohol into vinegar, turns the beer sour, but it is still safe to drink. And believe it or not, to this day, there's certain styles of beer you know, I can think of German Berliner Weiss and some of your Belgian Lambics that are very sour and, you know, some people actually enjoy that style. So I, I can never criticize somebody for liking a particular style, right? Also, the spent grains were full of protein. I mean, they would give that to the baker. They'd make bread out of it, make cookies. Small village brewer like this, first and foremost, would be a farmer. As such, you'd have some cows, some pigs, a very cheap and inexpensive way of fattening up your animals, just giving them your spent grains. And if you had that much, you'd simply put it into a compost pile, like I do, you know, put some leaves and stuff in there, it makes really good fertilizer the following year. 
So nothing would go to waste. Nothing would go to waste. Absolutely. Even the yeast at the end of the season when you're finished brewing, you know, you simply give that to the baker and they could make bread out of it. So I know our baker is doing uh, some experimental uh, batches there. She made some bread with some of my spent grains and some of the uh, spent brewing yeast there. So again, you're splashing it, you're getting the uh, hot side aeration, but again, there's not much you can do about it. You're not really going to taste it after a beer that's been in the bottle for 30 days. That's some more down the road, four or five months. But again, if somebody back then got a beer that was oxidized, you still drink it. Right? And like nowadays, where we're so spoiled, I mean, you go to the LCB or the beer store, you know, we buy a beer, if there's the slightest fault in there, right away we're online saying, oh, you know, I had this beer, and there's you know, slight fault on there. Back then, they didn't have that luxury, right? Well, 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 who do we have here now? Cooler work in as quickly as possible. Nowadays they have heat exchangers. You can uh, put boiling hot water in one end, get ice cold water coming out the other end. That technology did not exist in the 19th century, so what they would do is they'd pour their boiling water into a cooling ship, which is the vessel on the very top. And before it goes into the cooling ship, it's going to go through the hot back which is lined with cheesecloth. That's going to strain out our hops because you don't want anything floating in your beer at this stage. It's going to cause you a lot of grief. It's going to you know, clog the valves and spigots. In the 19th century, if you didn't have cheesecloth, you could use clean linen or worst case scenario, you'll take some straw, crisscross it through your hop back and you're going to pour the work through that. And you don't have to worry about contamination at this stage because you're still pouring uh, boiling hot water through it. So it's going to sanitize anything that's in there. I don't know if you saw, I uh, took a close look at our cooling ship, but we've also installed a cooling coil in our cooling ship, which was actually still to period. A lot of breweries in this time period would start purposely locating themselves beside a little stream, creek, brook, any sorts of cold running water. And they use gravity to flow water through a series of coils which were into the cooling ship to help in assisting the work. You want to cool the wort down as quickly as possible because at this stage it is open. Once it drops down to about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, there is always a possibility of wild yeast, which is naturally present in the air, contaminating your beer. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing because prior to the 19th century, they didn't even know yeast existed. So whatever wild yeast was in the air, that's what fermented your beer. I mean, even to this day, there's still some you know, Belgian farmhouse ales that use that same technique. By 1860s, brewers had established really good cultures of wild yeast that produce really good clean flavors. That's the kind of stuff that you want to pitch into your beer, not the wild yeast. I specifically see what you mean with the, uh, the steam and just hanging around with the CO2. Yeah, when it's uh, in the spring and in the fall, when this room is ice cold, yeah. you get even a more contrast there. Yeah, okay. And the only reason why I have the cooling coil in here is because we are brewing in the summertime, so I does yeah, require right. a little uh, extra boost there in the cooling process. If I was brewing in January and this was on the first floor of the building, I'd simply open up the door, a couple windows, and that would cool down in 20 minutes on its own without the use of a cooling ship, uh, or sorry, cooling coil. How are you today, sir? Fine, sir. How are you? I'm excellent. You're warm and cold at the same time? Uh, yeah. This is the hardest part of the brewing process, is transferring your boiling board up into the cooling ship. Once that's done, I mean, the whole stretch, everything is gravity fed from that point on. What I've done here, you can take a look at the uh, hop back here. It does do an excellent job at holding back those hops. So we started off with 95 liters 
aboard at the start of the boil after an hour, we end up with 85, so you get about 10% evaporation rate, which is pretty good. work in there for about five minutes and then I'll turn on the water for my cooling coil. That's just to help sanitize everything, right? Because I know throughout the course of the week people are jumping up and down and you get dust and stuff that probably gets in there. So it's just, just a bit great. of a yeah. Hello. Oh you guys like that smell, eh? It smells good, right? <laughs> Yummy. It does smell good. See? safer to drink beer than it was water. Well, it's most places on the top of us. But what about uh, temperance? Didn't, didn't they get the temperance, uh, originally they were going after the uh, hard whiskeys, and then about this time period there, they started going after uh, brewers there. That's why if you take our beer tour, we talk about how beers, uh, brewers got into politics. I don't know if you know right now, but there's a uh, commercial talks about Alexander Keefe's becoming yes. the mayor of Halifax. Right. And everybody thinks, oh, what a nice guy Alexander Keefe was. He became mayor four consecutive terms. He wasn't doing that to be a nice guy. He was doing that to protect his interests, right? Because the temperance movement wanted to close him down. But if you're mayor there, then you have a little bit of a, a little bit of pull there, right? So you're like, wait a minute there. If you're investing a lot of money in your brewery, and all of a sudden somebody wants to close you down, right? So yeah, you're very welcome. transfer the wort into our uh, fermenting uh, casks which are on the top barrel and in order to do that we're going to open up this little valve right here see my little funnel your yeast, which we'll do right now, because I like the yeast to go in first and then splash it in the work. Got a little bump. 
long hole at the top that I have covered with cheese cock, and I'm just using a standard uh, American variety of dry yeast. It's quite neutral, so I want the hops to shine, as opposed to uh, something like the brown or the best beer I use that an English style beer, so you're getting those fruity esters. That's one barrel, yeah. This is the part that always makes me nervous here, because, uh, like I said, there's wild yeast in the air right now. There's always a possibility of it getting affected. So far, I've been pretty lucky. I haven't uh, had any problems. Last year, the very last IPA that I made in December, I had a problem with that. So I don't know if it was uh, an infection in the barrel or just some bad yeast that I had. There. That was the only beer that I wasn't happy with last year. That would be a normal thing that they would have had to deal with back then too. Well, back then, if the beer was a little bit off there, they wouldn't throw it out there. Yeah, they just drink it anyway. Well, they would simply blend it with another style, right? So, uh, the, one of the origins, we don't know the true origins of the porter, but the story that I tell is originally it was called the Three French Beer. And it was uh, originated in the London, England area. It was a blend of three different types of beer a very old, stale, sour beer that was about a year old. And can you just imagine what beer would taste like? unpasteurized in an oak barrel for a year, probably not very good, right? But they would take that old stale beer and blend it with a, a very young beer, much like the brown ale that you had earlier on today. And something with some uh, dark grains in there, a little bit higher in alcohol, just to mask probably some of the flavors of the off beer. And because it had a lot of off beer in there, we think they sold it at a reduced cost. Who can afford reduced cost beers? Your hardworking laborers, like your porters, right? Everybody knows what a porter is, the guy that carries luggage on your trains. Because London was a central part of England, all the trains would come into London, the porters would get off, head over to the tavern, saloons, order the three threads, and eventually the bartender said, you know what, let's just call this a porter after the guys that are drinking it. So I always tell everybody, your porter was your first true working man's beer. Right? There is, uh, unfortunately, that's a half inch bell, a little bit small. So, next year, if I can uh, pop that, it would put a little bit uh, bigger bell. And it takes about half an hour to 45 minutes, which is a little bit long. So, it sits up there for over an hour. Did you uh, guys check out the, uh, the hop back? Yep. Oh, yeah, you got on there? Okay, good. You can actually see the, uh, I don't know if you can tell with the camera there, but that wort is actually running pretty clear. It's surprising me. There's no finings or Irish moss or anything. You'll see once the wort runs completely out, the, yeah, the copper sheet actually acts a bit of a fining region. You won't be able to tell now, but you'll see all the truth in there. It does a really good job of holding it back. Is the uh, the game of doing it by hand and absolutely, especially in here where you're answering people's questions as they're coming and, and it can get quite busy here, especially on the weekends, right? It's Friday today, it's not that busy. Come here on some weekends, there it's just jammed all day long. I bet everybody finds it interesting though to come in and watch you doing your job. Oh, yeah, absolutely, there. Yeah, you saw the reaction a lot of people as soon as they walked in that smell, right? So they're like, oh god, I absolutely love that smell, right? Which is funny because some of the kids there will come in and they'll be pulling their nose and other kids are like, oh God, I love that smell, what is it? And I'm like, oh geez, if you love the smell now, until you get a little bit older, you're really going to like it, right? 
go ahead and buy yourself some Malta right now. <laughs> well, I've got a uh, godson there that he hates beer, right? But he likes Ovaltine. So I always tease him there when he's making Ovaltine. I go, see, you really do like beer, right? Because all uh, that is is you know, dehydrated yeah. uh, spring, uh, malted barley, right? 